Hello and welcome to another DF Retro live stream. Something we have not done in quite a while, but we're all here. Uh, first at the top there, we got Audie Surly. He's back. I'm back on the channel live. It's been a while. It hasn't That's been. right. With those nice I've been Jaguar on the Patreon. games. Yeah, and of course we have a special guest today. It's Mike Micah, the legendary Mike Micah from Digital Eclipse. Welcome. <laughs> I've never, I don't think I've been introduced as legendary before, but I'll take it. <laughs> I yeah. don't have Jaguar games behind me like that, though, like what Audi has. But That's okay. I'm sure you've got you brought the, You brought the Jaguar <laughs> back, which is the important part. You, you did. And I think that's, you know. So for everybody here in the audience, why are we doing this? Cause, well, I wanted to highlight Atari 50 and talk about it because this thing blew my mind. I picked up a copy last week and have been playing through it. I got the German version, though, with the giant USK badge, which shifted the entire artwork to the right. So, oof. But yeah, it's uh, this is an amazing collection. This is the kind of thing that it's just... This breaks down these games in a way. This is not just a ROM collection, right? And obviously, Mike, I think that seems to have been the whole sort of driving factor behind this collection, to make something that's like a museum piece more than just ROMs. Yeah, I think this is kind of the culmination of something we've been wanting to do for a really long time. Actually, if you go all the way back, um, we had done like a Midway collection for PlayStation where we did interviews with the original game creators like Eugene Jarvis and that. And uh, at the time, when you think back in the early 90s, it was still only 10 years <laughs> after like those games. And so we did that. We thought it was amazing. <laughs> and then Midway was kind of like, oh, you know what? Like, that's extra money. We don't need to oh. lose a lot of the games. And so we hadn't really done anything like that for a while, but I've been thinking about it for for two decades or more about trying to get to this point. And so the whole goal, obviously, is like clearly anybody can go out there and find ways to play any of these games. But like, if you're going to put value into something like this, what is the extra thing you can do that would be fascinating or interesting to people? And so we've been kind of honing this. Uh, Frank Cefaldi, who's um, he came in with like Mega Man Legacy Collection, SNK 40th, and helped push a little bit of this too. And we've just kind of ultimately pulled all these pieces together of everything we want to do into one one thing here with a with a partner to their credit, Atari. Uh, they were just we we told them the idea and they're just kind of like, okay, like do it. Like, can cool. we can we do things that like maybe might not look so good about Atari's past? Like we're all new people here, go for it. <laughs> so it was all really good. <laughs> so that's that's amazing. And actually, just just flipping through this here, one of the things that really stands out to me is like. How fast and fluid the menu system is! Like, yeah, how are right. you guys? How are you guys pulling in all these high res images so quickly? Like, I'm actually on the Switch version here. Like, what what is this menu system? It's, it's really all, good. It's all homegrown. We have an internal engine that we've perpetually always said we're going to rename it someday. Um, but uh, it's, it's not, not as cool yet. as like Carbon <laughs> Engine that like Limited Run has. Or like that. We're we're called Bake Sale because like we're sitting at a restaurant called Bake Sale Betty's. We're like, what do we call it? Let's just call it Bake Sale for now. Uh, but it's a, it's a homegrown engine. And yeah, the sandwiches are good at the real place. You should trademark um, it. Their menus are slower there. That's true. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, so with that, we're able to actually kind of streamline a lot of this stuff. We don't have to go through an engine that does things for, you know, FPSs or anything like that. We're, we kind of built this for looking at 4K assets on devices that are really small mm. and that sort of thing. So we stream in stuff constantly. There's a lot of smart stuff going on behind the scenes. And one of our biggest things that we we've been pushing for since I say Mega Man, really, is the ability to move through menus super fast. Because yeah. you, like, you do it with, with the web, you do it on your phone. If we can't match that, then there's something wrong. We wanted to be able to like have something that's really punchy because you don't know where you want to go. And if we label things right and make the habit trails really easy, you should be able to get somewhere really fast. Exactly. And it's like, you know, I'm zooming in here, smooth panning around, perfect 60 frames per second. It is a better <laughs> experience than... Uh, just a website, I think, in terms of just being able to access this stuff. And man, all, how how did you uh, like? Where did all these assets come from? Because like the quality of the scans, for instance, like just tracking this stuff down, this is tough. We had to go find it. We have a lot of associations. Obviously, we work with like the Strong Museum, the Video Game History Foundation, the Video Game History Museum, all these people everywhere. But we had them rescan things because there's a lot of stuff online. That's really mm -hmm. low res, but like every time we do one yeah. of these, we need scans from the source material. And so we spend a lot of time and money and resources just tracking everything down, right down to the prima donna shirts and all these things. Like it's one thing to mention it, but you want to show the item. And so that that's we have a whole team. Like we have an editorial team, a more like an archaeological team that from day one goes out and tries to find everything possible. And I'd say like that's we cool. achieved maybe one tenth of what we wanted with this. 
but we shoot really far because we yeah. want so many crazy things. And it was also during the pandemic too, so we're, we felt oh, like man. we were just hitting brick walls everywhere because nobody wanted to meet up, nobody wanted to open a facility, no one would let us go through their tote bins in their garage or any of that kind of stuff because everybody was still freaking out. Oh yeah, absolutely, man. So. For everyone watching, this is actually a good example of just the, the kind of context that you get, right? You're going down the timeline, you get to this, pinball, right? Okay. Mm. Uh, the first thing you do is you guys have this video here where Eugene sort of talks about uh, the nature of them doing these pinball tables. And he actually gets into some of the technical problems with the actual pinball table design, which is really interesting to hear direct from the source. But then you can actually come down here. You got all these these posters and flyers with all this detail showing you exactly what they were advertising. And I feel like this kind of stuff just like, even though you can't play the pinball game here, you now learn a lot more about it and get like a sense of it in a way that like you can't just get from a normal video, I guess. It just, it's this combination of everything together that really brings it home for me at least. It's funny because there was a mention on, I almost feel like people online after we released it are articulating what this is better than we are. Because someone said this is the ultimate version of the 90s multimedia experience we were promised. Oh, I'm like, yes. yes. Can we put that on the back of the box? Because <laughs> that's that's essentially what it is. But also, I think more so, we're trying, we've been struggling with how does how do games tell their own story? How do, how do games document their history? Rather than having yeah. a documentary that you watch on Netflix about video games, how can we tell that story within a game, within a yeah. construct like this? And I feel like we're, we're just at the tip of the iceberg on it, but I want to go really far with that because that's the way you enjoy all this. That's the way you enjoy even yes. more modern games. I would love after a game of the year, like a game of a year of the year edition should be stuff like this. Here's the game you yes. play, yes. but here's all the extra stuff and all the behind the scenes stuff and everything it took to get that game that was so amazing out the door. And I think there's so many talented people out there, uh, like No Clip and all these guys that like a partnership with, with those kind of groups with, a, with a, something like this would be amazing. Absolutely, yeah. The kind of stuff I would love to see taken even further is like if you could basically put people into the game at specific points that they're talking about in the context and maybe like show some visualizations and some, you know, wireframes and just fun stuff to let people sort of see the underlying uh, game in action, you know? You're doing or it like, right now with something I can't wait oh. to announce. You're going to love it. It's oh, so no. good. I was just looking at it yesterday. I'm like, this is it. This works so great. <laughs> oh, man, I love it. Just like Ninja Golf here for the 7800. Who, who's a Ninja Golf fan? Everyone now, because this game <laughs> just blew up. This is like the most famous game on the collection now that people <laughs> discovered it. So it Man, deserves it. <laughs> it's, it's something. It, it is something, something for sure. Hey John, there is a super chat. Oh, which is uh, fifteen mir m y r. Oh, it's sure from Nash. Current... He's Hello. a yeah, from Nash behind Friend of the show, yeah. Nash. Good to, yeah, good so... to see you here, buddy. It says hi, John. Audio and Mike. Digital Foundry rules, and then he does the horns. Oh, so thank thanks you. so much. <laughs> what what the currency is? Myr. I'm not sure. Mm, Actually, right. but check I check this out though. Ninja Golf is totally okay. I'm, it's got this parallax scrolling going on here, where they're doing the kind of you know updating the different layers at a different rate, even though it's only one layer. But man, so have, have you ever actually worked with? the 7800 mic in any capacity or is it just like only from, <laughs> from so what what are your thoughts on this thing like what what do you think could be done on this machine given the you know it's a, it's a really capable machine it's, it's a really capable machine i don't think it would have yeah. i don't think if it had released when it was supposed to release that it would have actually beat the nes <clears throat> uh but wow. it would have given a nice little run for the money because technically you can do a lot with it uh as you would imagine it was coming along and i think a lot of people in in the time contextually mm -hmm. Uh, we're ready to just move on from Atari. So it had a lot of stuff under the hood that'd be really fun to play with. But if there, most people generally just like hit the, sh the shallow surface of, of the tech. So you're seeing stuff in the homebrew community right now that demonstrates how you can get like arcade perfect ports and all these sorts of mm -hmm. things that would have been uh, capable at the time for people to do, uh, ability to do it, but like just wasn't really getting tapped. And so I think it, because it was so late that it came out, that it also kind yeah. of gets a little bit of a shaming that goes on when it had come out when they yeah, intended yeah. to. Maybe even <laughs> skip the 5200, go straight to the 7800. That's, that's probably a big better thing. situation. That's probably what they should have done, yeah. It's very underappreciated for what it could have done. I mean, some of these games, you know, they could have probably done a lot more closer to what the best of the Commodore 64 did. That yeah. kind of level yeah. of games where you're exactly. just beneath the NES's capabilities, but 
you're still at the very height of a lot of experimentation from Europe, like which so, yeah. really broke new ground. So that's the question I have then about the 7800. Do you know if it can support like additional hardware in the cartridges, like mapper chips for the NES? Because uh, yeah, I think it can actually. Oh, I think that excellent. was actually intended from the design side, and there might actually be there might actually be some work there going on in the homebrew side too, because it is capable of having much larger cartridges. How that awesome. gets activated might not be exactly how the 2600 did. I, I, this is the reason I love doing these collections is because I actually get to go into the code on a lot of these. We have to <laughs> yeah, try, yeah. you know, we have to put in like achievements. We have to like change things to work better, that sort of thing. Or sometimes timing needs to be adjusted for uh, stuff. So it's like it's really cool going in and looking at the stuff from the inside out. And yeah. uh, so I, I was just cracking the surface with it, and uh, I, I would I've actually been thinking about like what would be my project on 7800 if I were to do it, and I'm still not quite sure yet. But like I like these arcade games we've been kind of doing for holidays lately and oh, i'd love yeah. to do something like that for the 7800 mm -hmm. and try to get a cart out for the 7800 or something along, along those lines that would be really cool yeah there is another super chat john from rodrigo silva with uh, five eyes who says uh, play master system folks master system live stream next please well you know in a weird way behind me is a master system playing impossible mission but it's blown out on the camera so we're no, almost there i see <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! I love the Impossible Master System mission. as well, obviously. Yeah, it's but, amazing. Uh, yeah, I would, I would love to do more Master System stuff. And uh, absolutely, I don't know if you knew, know Mike, but I used to live in Brazil for a bit. So I was there in the early 2000s when, like, the Master System market was still active, it's still going. And I, amazing. and I didn't realize at the time what this was. I was just kind of like, oh, you still have Master System stuff here? That's weird. And I didn't buy anything. But you know, oh. I could have bought like all these ports that are from Jim Port, Street Fighter, Mercy. You could have bought Twitter. <laughs> could have bought Twitter yeah, with, that. Back then, <laughs> yeah. with that. With that, or back then. If, if it oh yeah, existed. even back then maybe. Even back then. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's fun stuff. I I love digging into history in like different countries like that because being European. Uh, that's something that goes into these projects that we now do in our respective companies. It's kind of, you were mentioning ROM lists and stuff earlier, John. I think the oh, big yeah. thing about these collections are we can give context. And I think the value yep. of context give a lot more value to the game. Big time. Uh, because people, yeah, people kind of realize what made these games special, uh, yep. why this one particular game is different from the other rather than just having a list of names picking it and it's like well this is a simple atari game but then when you read a bit about it it's maybe not that simple or maybe there's a fun story behind it from the creator there's all these things there's context to everything and exactly. so I mean, that's pretty much what i try to do with df retro episodes is give yeah. context mm -hmm. and stuff you know not interactive but it's still that same idea because i think context is not interactive yet uh, we haven't yeah, made that cdi someday. df retro yet well, well it's like know, when we're doing the playable um, on cdi <laughs> when we're doing the um blizzard arcade collection uh, we did something for the first time where we had realized rock and roll racing was really huge and i think i could get this wrong but i think it was brazil and so <laughs> anyone who's playing that game in Brazil, they have custom announce lines by Larry Huffman, who did the voice in Rock and Roll Racing, that adds really? and it actually includes call-outs that were popular things that like streamers and stuff in Brazil would say when they're playing the game. And so we oh, put okay. those in from Larry Huffman's mouth and put some extra features there because we knew that those are the super fans and just like sat back and waited until people started to notice. And it was, it was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, this is something I always torment Joe with. It's like all these tidbits from Europe as well that go that we can now put into our collections with me, uh, part of limited run. And he's just always like, oh, just all, all this extra work you're coming in with. <laughs> so that's what makes it's it so much fun. I think people really enjoy kind of going through these collections now and discovering. I mean, this is the this is the new peak, right? The Atari Fifty is just raising the bar for everyone. So um, thanks to Mike, I'll, I won't have a job in a few months because I won't be able to no. do it. <laughs> Not at uh, all. <laughs> we have another super chat from Ozone Nightmare. Uh, uh, very five bucks. Uh, very happy to see you stream, guys. Always happy to see Atari highlighted, especially a collection made with care and admiration. Oh, thank and, yeah, you. I mean, Mike, like, what did the Atari twenty six hundred and upwards mean to you as a gamer? Uh, oh yeah. I mean, that was my origin story. Uh, Atari mm -hmm. was it for me. I have so many incredible memories tied to the Atari 2600 and my friends and 
it's it's funny because a lot of people when I reminisce about the twenty six hundred, like, did you ever go outside? Did you ever ride bikes? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> like you did all that stuff, but it was just so. It was the first time it was like interwoven into a lifestyle, and you know we go doing dumb stuff all day and then come home and play like pitfall or we'll do whatever. And it was just like part of life back then. And for me, like the attraction on Sunday, I remember opening it on Christmas morning. I remember what games I had. I remember trading games and like saving money and going to Toys R Us, uh, which is, you know, over here was a crazy kind of like almost like a theme park because to oh, get yeah. games, you'd have to At like, the time, yeah, yeah you'd that. have to grab a tag and go to a cage and give yep. them this tag. And they would go to the back and come back with this like gift. That was amazing. Uh, so all that stuff, like Christmases, and I, I just, I tie it to places I remember and people I remember. And mm -hmm. the people I played those games with are, like, forever friends. And so, like, to me, that's what Atari needed to be. It had to be very respectful of people's memories of what this was. And so to do that doesn't mean that we're going to make fun of games. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Jaguar, everything. It's like, yeah, now we can, like, always look back and poke fun at stuff. But it goes back to that thing where a lot of people like to make fun of, like, Atari Pac-Man, for instance. But, like, mm -hmm. I'd say anybody who lived through it, a majority of them are probably like, well, I actually really liked it, but I didn't know it was bad until I got older. <laughs> and, you know, it's like yeah, that kind of, because you expected games to be interpretations. You didn't expect Arcade Perfect back then. And so yeah. we wanted to take that kind of approach. Very respectful. A lot of people have emotional connections to these games. So one, one way to deal with that would be make sure we present it in the best possible light so it looks like we took care of this. We're not going to go cheap on anything. We're not going to let one game run terrible because nobody cares or any of that kind of stuff. Those conversations that always go on when you're putting these things mm. together, people are like, well, don't, no one will play it. It's like, no, we have to make sure it plays as good as it can possibly play. That means yeah. that we have to go in and hack the ROMs, uh. do whatever to give it its best light. Let's do it. So that's actually uh, something I, I really liked here was the, let's see here, like at, the way you do the simulation of the uh, these vector monitors. This yeah. really nice filter. It's maybe hard mm. to see in the stream, but uh, having played a lot on vector monitors, it, it really captures that sort of like shimmery feeling of the of the light. I, I'm playing on Switch here, though. Did you consider like supporting HDR on the other consoles? We did, and that's still a conversation going on. We're working on something right now that I don't know if we're gonna go retroactively back into this or not. We right, might. right, sure. But um. That's our goal. We want this to look like a real vector monitor. We like yeah. not only should the lines look like they're alive, but it has to have that glow that looks like only something with that high contrast can provide. Yeah, because uh, exactly. that's just like it's it's ethereal. You just can't replicate <laughs> that in a normal display. And when you see nope. it, you know why this was magic. And so we're doing a lot of things related to that. Um, the luminosity from any CRT, all that kind of, all yeah. these crazy effects that have been going on. We've that. been like we've got a wish list of all these things we're trying to tackle with each success. And make sure that each thing gets it. And ultimately, we'd like to go back then and retrofit some of these. Like, you have Asteroids up, but like Asteroids Deluxe, there's the, the layered cardboard that's reflected in the background. Oh, yeah. yes, you go to yes. Asteroids Deluxe, we, we, we knew we couldn't track the player's head. So I just tracked the ship, and I try to have a subtle parallaxing that goes on there. I so you still this. get the same effect. Yeah. yeah. So you can see it subtly move yep, yep. and everything based off of where the ship is. And when you go off the edge of the screen, it kind of scrolls over. Uh, and that's just something we haven't had before when we're representing Asteroids Deluxe. And, and other games have all similar things, like the, oh. the actual lamps on the bezels light up when the code says to, and all these things. We yes. want to make sure that's all captured. There's and someone that's... Uh, There's someone in the chat, by the way, uh, under the Digital Eclipse name, so I'm guessing it's uh, one of your colleagues there, Mike, but saying Jeremy Williams created not just a filter, but a specific rendering technique for the Vector games. Ooh. Yeah, so he's the guy who created Vector Sector, the, the yeah. reimagining game that's in here as well. He started with that and created the vectors for that. It's almost kind of like a, a study of how the vectors should look and what things right, we can kind right. of do with them. And then mm. we went to each of these vector emulations and uh, we, we kind of established a way that we can gather all, all of these, what needs to be displayed and, and put it through a very similar system, if not yeah. a lot of the same system. That's, he, that's, he spent a lot of time on it. He loves vector games. So, so he was like the that, right person for it. That's yeah. kind of the key, the key to this collection, I feel, is like uh, I love how each individual game has its own treatment. Mm -hmm. Like this this extra detail here for the parallax sort of layers, that's such a cool thing, but you didn't have to go that far. Are there any uh, uh, color vector games in here? Yeah, so we have, um, I'd say probably one of the better ones is uh, Major Havoc. I love that game. Oh yeah, that's on here. There it is. So is that one of the things about color vector monitors I always notice is that they look slightly lower resolution to the eye. You know what I mean? Like the mm -hmm. monochrome vectors are like super sharp. 
Yeah. Yeah, and you can see here it's slightly less sharp than the monochrome vector, mm -hmm. which is accurate to the real thing. Look at that. Yeah, game this goes. is this game has the hardware for this is really unique. And this is something like Jeremy and Vernon Brooks, who is our uh, emulation engineer on this, really handled well because it has clipping. So when scrolling around inside the building, there's the map scrolling. If you notice, the upper part of the screen doesn't have it. It has vector clipping going on. Yeah, yeah. Which is kind of a new concept for these kind of games. And then uh, when things explode, they have like this distorted pixel kind of like it uses purples and whites and kind of a. I'd say like Jeremy basically took the ratio of those displayed on the real hardware and came with an algorithm to generate the same thing for when something explodes. Along with the glowing, ends up rendering it looking very similar to what Major Havoc looks like in real life. That's so wild. I love this stuff. So, there's a few more uh, super chats and then also there's some questions which I will take okay. from the chat. Go for so it. So the first of all, the super oh. chat is from Nelasco. It. it is a hundred svenska kronor. Uh, my retro dudes, long time no see in the stream. More please. Uh, let hard copies of games live on forever. Uh, yes, absolutely. And do uh, definitely go out and buy a hard copy of Atari 50. Um, some questions here. So Captain Logan asks you, how does the team go about picking which games to include into this collection? Oh, that's a great oh, question. Because yeah. I think a lot of people misunderstand how this, this process kind of works. And mm. it has so many entry points. Um, when we start one of these, we have to do kind of an audit. It's a really extensive process where we have to figure out what games a company actually owns. And even the company itself that we're working with sometimes doesn't know. And so we have to kind of go through this big vetting process, which can be expensive and take a long time. And so you start to work with what you, what you believe is a set of games that somebody owns or has access to. And then in the case of this, of course, people are like, where's Pitfall? Where's whatever? Well, if you think about it, Activision's kind of in a weird spot right now with Microsoft. There's a lot of stuff not really happening in regards to if you consider this like kind of a smaller thing. Mm -hmm. So it's really challenging to have a conversation with Activision when they're caught up in something really big right now and try to get an approval for something like this too. And we don't even know if we would get it or right. you know how much it's going to cost or anything like that. So you just you keep hope alive when you're going through this, but you have to kind of work uh, really flexibly. So when you're going through this, uh, the editorial team is probably the one uh, almost as impacted as the engineering team because things are coming and going all the way up to the last day. Like, this game can't be included. Pull it out. This game can go in, oh. put it in. And so you're the one of the other, when you're talking about like our engine, one of the other aspects of it is that we need flexibility. So it has that mm. really well built in. The team did a great job doing that uh, to be able to insert and remove things at a rapid pace, especially up near the end. And so when we're going through all that, it's like, okay, that's good. But then there's also... Um, ratings and the ratings board. So like some games might have blood and we want to get this into certain stores and yeah. all this sort of stuff. So you have to really, when you have a hundred games, you're on a, you're teetering on this like go, no go uh, because of all the content we have. So we have to make really critical choices on what games we want to include, no matter how much we want to include it. Like for one yeah. game that we think we should include, might have to get rid of 10 others just to satiate the, the ratings board or whatever. Um, so there's that side of it. Then there's budget ultimately where it's like how much is it going to cost to do all these things and some things have not to go so deep into this but some things have sunset times which means that we only get the the license for like a year and it's yeah. like okay well we could do that but then we don't want to change this app a year later and mm -hmm. remove something or just stop selling it so maybe that has to come out so there's so much of this and imagine like 10 times all those issues oh that's gosh. Where, like so much work goes in and even after we ship sometimes we've had to patch things out because legal clarity suddenly shows up when we thought we already had it. So the one game that you really wanted to include that you couldn't that you can tell us about? Pitfall. I wanted Pitfall yeah, so Pitfall. bad. Oh, of Pitfall course. in the Activision line would have been amazing to have in here because that was mm. almost like there's Atari and there was Activision. Those were kind of like the major ones and sure Magic and all those other guys were great, but like that would that made up the habit trail for me on my Atari. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, did you ever? I was curious why there was no uh, blue lightning on here. Is that a game? Was that a, not owned by Atari? No, no way, really. Yeah. Did, who who owns that? <laughs> um, <You know? laughs> I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's okay. Uh, wow, you that's can imagine. Wild. So Atari's gone through several hands, right? Like right yeah, now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wade Rosen and uh, I always call them the Ethans and Dave and Don. The guys who are at Atari right now, amazing. They're doing amazing things to try to reverse a lot of things that have happened with Atari over the years. And so you have this oh, Atari cool. 50. I think you know, there's a big gap at the end where it kind of just jumps from Jaguar to now, some stuff. But yeah. in that time, there's a lot of stuff that happened that's really hard to track. And so mm -hmm. there's some games that got sold, some games that then some 
trademarks are sold, all that kind of stuff. I don't know all the details of that. I'm just like putting it sure, all in sure, one sure. big bucket. Yeah, um, no. But like Atari, like Atari's doing really well right now to try to reconstitute things, confirm things, do all that sort of stuff. So really, I'm hopeful that like stuff gets more sorted out later. But at, at this right. point, it was just we, we we have what we have. We had to kind of work with it. That's and there's always Atari 51, right? Exactly. Yeah, Atari 51 and 52. <laughs> Make it like Madden, like annualized. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can include some ST and stuff eventually. So, oh man, uh, ST is a good one. That's what everyone oh, wants. Yeah. It's like we wanted ST in there too, but turns out Atari doesn't own a lot of ST things. Oh, That's another gosh. one that we had yeah. to go track down. So, think on the Jaguar side. Did you explore the Jaguar CD as far as emulation goes? Yeah. So, um, Rich, who worked on the emulator for that, uh, I believe. He got pretty far with it, or if not completed it, I'm not. I can't. I'm sure, not sure, sure, sure. But like, we were definitely going down that path, and ultimately, if we were to do more Jaguar stuff later, we wanted to be able to support that. Uh, right, you know, right. Games like Battle Morph and stuff like that all makes sense. So um, it'd be cool to to kind of go after that. And that's uh, Rich Whitehouse. It's uh, really incredible of what he does. He oh, did yeah. the Jaguar emulation. So yeah, the, huge the emulation here is is really really good. So like. Uh... There's some nice games on here. Where is Atari Carts? There it is. Yeah. Atari Carts is, is a very impressive game for the Jag, I think. It's very nice looking. And by the way, I like the kiosk design around there. Yeah, yeah. I was going to mention that. That's the kiosk <laughs> design, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, yes. we've, I've used that at the at Jag Fest, which was... Right, uh... that's where I also recognized it from. And I was like, wow, that can't be the... like. But you really went into that much detail. When Which you know, you know, right? It's like yeah, uh, yep. there's a store uh, near our office in Alameda that actually has a Jag kiosk still active <laughs> yes. in the store. <laughs> so right. we went over there and did, it took the photography of it to make sure we could have it. It was great. <laughs> Just amazing. Uh, there yeah, is I, one... I say a shout out to uh, the experience in, in Alameda. They're, they're the store that provided that. I have to give them a little shout out because they have so many cool Sega things. You guys got to go check it out. That's awesome. The experience in Alameda. Uh, there was one question here that's actually quite good, and I'm I'm interested in two because I do follow this uh, community a bit. Are these accurate enough to be used for speed running and world record attempts and practice? Ooh. They can be. What we have in the collection right now is kind of like a best light version of the Jaguar. Like we can dial in to have like really timed, like e e exactness, if you will, or whatever, like uh, accuracy on the games. But what we kind of chose to do here. And uh, this is a good call, I think, is to make sure that when the game's asking for the frame rate it wants, we kind of give it yeah. to the game. Yep. Uh, so, because like a modern, a lot of modern players, we saw this with our testers. So a lot of our testers were our kids were coming in and testing all the time. And they'd complain about not only like Jaguar yeah. games, but Atari 800 <laughs> games. And that's yeah. their thing about like how slow they would get at certain points. Mm -hmm. And so they don't expect that. So we kind of lifted the throttle up. Because um, the, real, the real challenge with Jaguar is making sure that all these things can communicate, all the processors, and they can communicate yeah. with each other in a way that they don't bottleneck and have like basically seize up and that's where a lot of problems occur in emulating but rich tackled all that part but then it was like uh what's the intent of the game does it want this and so if you look at stuff like tempest 2000 which there was some chatter online i was trying to figure out the best way to kind of like answer it without making it seem like we're you know that it was hurting the the emulation at all because rich did such a great job and there's choices made so basically here i'm kind of like explaining it's like we really wanted tempest just to play the way tempest wanted to play uh, it's kind of like the PlayStation version of it. If you ever played the PlayStation version of Tempest, Tempest X on there, which is Tempest mm -hmm. 2000, it that's what it feels like when the game gets what it wants. And so we're we're more in line with that. Yeah, but that makes sense. future updates, we're actually considering: do we put a throttle and toggle it? Because we want peers to be able to say, like, this is the game I played, and I have habit in my hands <laughs> that make me play a game the way I play it. So we have to support that. For the record, so, this this game does run at sixty frames per second on real hardware. I can confirm. One so. of the few, yeah. One of the few. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but you would say that like in general, people could use Atari Fifty for twenty six hundred games, and whatever for speed running practice. At yeah, least. There's, yeah, it should be accurate enough. I would like to. We've done this before with like Street Fighter and everything. I would like to get those confirmations from the speed running community. Oh yeah. That there's no like because there's all these tests you kind of have to do. Like in fact. Crystal Castles. Uh, I talked to somebody mm -hmm. who's really well versed in Crystal Castles who told me, just basically gave me like a list of it has to be able to do these things in these conditions. And so, like, I'm one of the worst Crystal Castles people. So, they're trying to get the controls <laughs> right and everything like that. But to achieve the, the kind of moves you can do in Crystal Castles was where I had to have um, make sure it was, was correct. So, with 100 games, we, we picked choice games that we know people were most concerned with. 
and yeah. tackled those, but there's still some that we haven't really tested to make sure that it doesn't have some sort of extra advantage or that sort of thing. You see, sure. we talked like, a little oh, bit about actually, this. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, like, Minor 2049 is a good example. Oh, yeah. Um, we have a speed up button because, like, you sometimes in that game, there's people who speed run that. And mm. the complaint was it takes so long to walk from one place to another and it's kind of boring. So we have, like, a, a fast forward button you can hit. We, the clock accelerates, everything accelerates. So, really, you have to be better at the game than when you're fast forwarding and playing versus when you're just playing normal. So yeah, yeah. we felt like that's a good way. If you want to consume that game the way you, with speed, do it. But like you're just making it harder for yourself. Wait, wait. Before you continue, I got to know. If you had to choose, Minor 2049er or Manic Miner on the Specky, which one? <laughs> that like You're evil. That's a tough one. Because <laughs> Manic Miner is like a totally... It's a different game to me. It's it's so it was so unrelenting, but I loved yeah. that about it. It's like yeah. it was like the um made like Celeste in its day or whatever, where it's like everything had to be just right. Jumping over that so little brutal. rub, but avoid the, yeah. the, the slag tight <laughs> and like land on a conveyor belt. Like that stuff like you don't think about when you're playing Minor 49 as much. And so See, I don't know. It's hard to compare, but I love Manic Miner so much. We were we were perplexed. What we a few years ago we were at the uh, EGX this. in London. <laughs> yeah, and uh, our dare boss uh, Richard Ledbetter sat down on the specky with the rubber keys and everything, and they had Manic Miner playing, and he just like went, went through it without it. even thinking about it. And uh, so we found we, out that day that he was like a secret savant of the Manic Miner on the specky. It's Your mind just fills up with every condition in that game because every level right? is so muscle memory. crafted. It's yeah, pure it just comes memory. back. <laughs> we were Absolutely talking wild. a little bit about this before going on here, but we were talking about how you know the Jaguar for its uh, highs and lows. It's like it's an experience you only get on Jaguar, and it's hard to get now. But yeah. Atari Fifty, you know, brings this back, and it's really fun in the case of Atari Carts, right? Because that's like a four hundred dollar game now. It's so it expensive. Is, yeah get that cartridge just a cartridge or a box and now with the far atari 50 not only do you get that but you get all these other games so it's really you know for preservation's sake and for accessibility uh this collection is so important yeah, I mean, that's I, my dream would be to put every jaguar game on this like that would be, like, every, to be able to, like super <laughs> burnout and, that's my dream yeah. too <laughs> Yeah, I Man. mean, there's there, there's some big ones still. You know, there's Alien vs Predator, which obviously is under license and whatnot. Highlander, Highlander <laughs> on the Jaguar CD. Well, what a game! What a oh, game! Yeah. <laughs> um, it's like Alone in the Dark, Resident Evil style game in terms of control. Yep. And yep, it's it's neat. It was the super chat here. Uh, Twenty pounds from Mog it says, "Hi, Mike, John, and the Ghost of Phoenix Past." Uh, nice. Thanks for the superb stream. <laughs> I have no idea how much love and effort went, had been put into Atari 50. Bought and downloading right now. Oh, it, that's it great. Sale. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I are think you a lot of people felt that way. I think people are like, whoa, it's this, this is actually, like, this is different. <laughs> I didn't expect this. <laughs> Interactive documentary. You know, just uh, you learned so much from just playing this once. Uh, are you familiar with the Ghost of Phoenix past, Mike? Oh my god. You know, did he say his name? I it went by Mog. Was it Mog? Mog, yes, I know Mog. Yes. Or we're, we're like Twitter buddies too. Okay. But are you familiar with the ghost of Phoenix past? That I need to know about. What is the Oh my uh, god. That was our that past. was our Christmas special for Digital Foundry here last year. I will send you a link <laughs> after this. Please uh, do. It, Sorry, I don't it, watch anything. Yeah. <laughs> Unless it it's a that's okay. Santa suit. So well, now I need yes. to have it. <laughs> with, with the beard and the eyebrows. With I was the expecting eyebrows. something Bubsy, but... Nope. Not, uh, this not, time. not yet. Not yet. It wasn't that happy of a Christmas. Uh, oh, man. Someone I... else also said, Bruno RS said, I remember you guys mentioning Atari cards during the Phoenix game stream last yep. year. Uh, yes, we did. I forget which game, though, that made uh, us mention it. Probably... There's there's a kart racer on there that's real bad. What's that one? Uh, it's not as good as Atari cars. All the Phoenix games They're are bad. They're all bad. Actually, uh, they... yeah. go ahead. No, I was going to say, someone's mentioning here, the pre uh, someone's asking if someone's selling pre-made paddles. We should mention the paddle adapters oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that you guys, you guys released the 3D schematics yeah. to make that's paddles. Insane. Yeah. yeah, we did these for like the Xbox controller. Oh, and like, yeah. The way it works is it's a gear system that was... There was something like this for racing games that somebody had done. So we modified mm. 
the basic idea of that. That allows you to play paddle games on Xbox. We have, um, I don't have the controllers in, but we have a Joy-Con version. So you slide the Joy-Cons in each side here, and that allows you to play with Joy-Cons. Man. You know, we're working, we're trying to find people who are advent adventurous enough to try to do PlayStation controller support too. There's so many buttons on that, I didn't know how to craft that. <laughs> But playing paddle games this way is, is just like the way to do it. And this actually feels, it looks crazy and janky, but it, it plays great. It feels just right. So oh, if really? you have a 3D printer, you can print these up. But we don't, we don't supply them. And I think there's a few people online who have said they're going to open up Etsy shops yeah. to provide these for people, which would be great. So that, that's you, an interesting thing about uh, Tempest 2000, though, Mike. Have you, have you played with the modified controllers for the real Jaguar? Yes. Yeah, so with the paddle that's included in there. Um, oh, I know insane. it wasn't... Like, we, we had some support for that, and we had a lot of questions about this. We had support in yeah. there. It was really tough to get right, and particularly, I think it was incomplete as well. So there's like, some mm. things you couldn't access you, in yeah, that you mode have, or whatever. You have to unlock it, like, a certain way. Like, Jeff Minter put it in there for a controller that didn't exist at the time, <laughs> yeah. basically, which is nuts. But, <laughs> but it's Someone neat, actually... and I, I think we might try to do something with it. Someone was actually Ooh. asking if you ever did consult Jeff Minter at all while working on this um you know like he's he's available we've talked with him recently about some things too um mm. he's uh he's fantastic and he's very helpful and like the the thing is yes and not only that <laughs> um i'm trying to go ahead back here oh, i won't pull it off the wall but i have a picture back here like right let's see if i can get my finger to this way there we go like right there okay. that's 1994 ces uh bob Baff, who's our audio director and myself with Jeff Minter, and it's the first time oh I met God. him. Oh my God, that's insane! And, mm. um, even then, he was super helpful because we wanted to break into games, and he was like, "Believe it or not, one of the most like, here's how you do it. Here's here's what the Jaguar is. Here's how, how I code it. I code it like this." And he was just going into all these details, and so to, from since that day, he's one of my heroes. That's so cool. Actually, while we're talking Jag hardware, this is something I wanted to ask you before is. Uh, so I'm a fan of the Jaguar. I've played a lot of games on there, but I've always been mystified by the 16-bit conversions and the number of games that are just simple side-scrollers that only updated at 30 frames per second when the counterparts on the 16-bit machines were 60. And I've never talked to anybody that's really worked on the Jag so much, and I'm wondering if you have any insight into why it might be that way. The Jag was, uh, was a pretty interesting beast <laughs> because um, it's... We are talking before the show, and there's a little bit of, like, it has an evolution. It does feel kind of like an Amiga. It feels like other things. But it was its own unique set of processors that had their own unique problems. A lot of that came from the fact that, like, they did not, as much as you're supposed to rely on them communicating with each other very quickly, they had a lot of problems with that. So Whoa. you had to, like, go around issues uh, with that to, to get it to work. And so one of the easiest things for people who are porting games to do, you had a 68,000 processor right there. Just try to get that code running on that. So don't take, don't get the benefits of the actual architecture of the machine. Just find the cheapest, fastest way to get this game to run on it. And that's what a majority of people did. They just took the source code, instead of reinventing it entirely, tried to just port it to the 68,000, which they understood. And multiprocessor programming was still fairly new back then right. for game developers. And they, a lot of people couldn't get their heads around it, myself included. It was my brother who managed to do most of that work whenever we were trying to get stuff running on it. Um, but it just broke my brain. And so... A lot of that was really that, because it's capable of a lot more, had some errors in the way it's constructed uh, and the way it communicates that I don't think anybody anticipated, but there's ways around it. But to do all that and to, to get a game out in time, but your schedules probably for those games were ridiculously small. Um, I think the, oh, yeah. the temptation to just port to the 68,000 and leave it be was too great for a lot of people. And that's interesting then, because I guess then it would fall to whatever the video display processor is on the JAG versus the other systems and how they handle that. Cause, or were they just potentially running purely on the 68 K? Cause like the CDI is like that. Cause it really doesn't have anything in the way of graphics processing. So it's all done in software on that CPU. So it's slow. I wouldn't doubt it. Cause like, if you think about it, they feel like <laughs> CDI 2d games, right? Like, yeah. There's like a, a certain bit. chugginess to it. That's like, okay, yeah. it's trying really hard to do what it needs to do. And I always oh, thought it was man. ironic they called it the Tom and Jerry chipset because, like, I, I just remember them beating each other up all the time. Exactly. And so it's like that's what it was. That's what it felt that's, like when you're using that system. <laughs> that's what it does. <laughs> so we have another super chat from the deconstructionist six six. It's five bucks. It says thanks for the amazing new theme music for Star Wars. Oh Raiders. yeah, that's so good. So, somebody please get the rights to Berserk. The intruder must not escape. 
Oh man, there's a couple parts of that, but like Star Raiders, Bob Baffy, our art director, who I've known since high school, um, he did a deep dive on Star Raiders. There's, all, there's so many versions and takes on Star Raiders from the ST version. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, there's a sequel to Star Raiders that we didn't include here that was made by Eric Wilmunder, uh, who, it's a true sequel to Star Raiders, not the Star Raiders 2 that came out. And it's 3D wireframe. It's like mind blowing how advanced it was. You can fly down to a planet's surface and fly back up, but it's all still in the Star Raiders construct and oh, code man. base. That's insane. Ridiculous. I wanted to include it in here, but it was hard to get clearance on things. But you can look online and see that game in action. Uh, but all of those things have different musics and music sets, and Bob took inspiration from all of it. So it felt like it was something that was meant to be for Star Raiders. Um, so that was really cool. And then Berserk, one of my favorite games of all time. I made a 2600 hack for that years ago that added the voice back into the Atari 2600 cartridge so you could hear all the lines like, Intruder must not escape and all that kind of stuff. And so I, like, I'd like i love to have Berserk in this if I could. Mm. Man, I, I just got to compliment you guys on the Star Raiders as well. The implementation here, like given that that's basically a, you know, an early PC game, like very keyboard driven, the the new interface for the gamepad, it's incredible. It like really manages to just work perfectly despite that. That's uh, what kind of work went in. I mean, I guess you guys had to do all these custom interfaces specifically for games like that, right? Yeah, I mean, Dave Reese, I work really closely with Dave Reese, who's been trying to get all the controls to work great with these games. And in this in this process, because he was kind of new to hacking games, and so um, to, to kind of redo things, rework things. Like in Minor Tour Fernando, for instance, there's a keyboard uh, request for when you're teleporting, where you have to press a number to help out your character. I had to go in there and change it where you can use the, the joystick to choose which mm. teleporter. Oh, so right. that required some hacking of the game and that sort of thing. So... Um, this is an, a great opportunity to have Dave learn the ropes on this stuff. And Star Raiders is one of those games that, that we kind of uh, met first on to kind of pull this this sort of thing off. And with that, what we do is we create just like in MGUI, which is like this de- like great um, inline debugging, like every uses it for display and everything. We, we decided since these early machines have very little RAM, we could display all of RAM on a screen oh, that's and so look cool. at the game. And so like while we're moving like a joystick left, we'd see, oh, that's coordinates changing or something that looks like it's a coordinate is changing. So mm-hmm. let's mark that and let's try things out. So in within like a day and a half, we had all the basic stuff we wanted from Star Raiders pulled out, as well as there's some disassemblies online for the Atari 800 version that we could reference. And then with all that information, we're like, what do we want in this? Because we're watching these young testers here uh, get really frustrated with the game because it's just like, yeah, it, yeah. it's just really hard to understand and everything like that. So our goal, we set our goal to be, if we can get them to play it and enjoy it, we, our job's done. So we just worked on all the stuff, put the display that they wanted up, uh, listen to their feedback about what, what they didn't understand. And so now in the game, you have text prompts that come and say, like, orbit with the station or do this, use this to hyperdrive or hyperwarp and all these sorts of things. And then the display is just from, like, we talked to so many people who thought it was a killer app when they were growing up or even like Jerry Jessup at Atari. And like hearing them talk about where they're like, you have to keep in your head the number of ships that are in the sector. So, you know, because exactly, they have colors will change and all that stuff, but you have to like, you have to be in the zone with it. And so we're like, what if we just display it? Or what if we display the damage status of the of the ship itself and break it out into the components that they are there? Because like, the stuff will come on screen and go away. You'd forget that. Like, oh, if I take one more shot, I'm probably dead. That kind of stuff. So we display <laughs> it everywhere. We made it feel like it's contextual to the, the game itself. And that's when we added the music. We also added an option to overclock because, again, uh, modern gamers are like, why is it yeah, so slow? Yeah, yeah. And it, why does it change the speed all the time? So we did that. But it makes it a harder game. So... <laughs> For a purist, you can go back and un, like unwind most of that stuff to be, play it like in its natural state, still with those kind of control updates. Because I think one yeah. of the biggest things we had to deal with was the the throttle. Because mm. you, on the keyboard, you go zero to nine. And so what I did is I made it where it's just the triggers, and the, yep. the time it takes to go from zero to nine is the same amount of time it takes from zero on the keyboard to nine. And then you have full granular control then of the thrusters. Because I could poke into the RAM of the Atari. Uh, 5200 and say this is what you are now this is how fast you're going this is how fast you're going so there's this two-way communication with the emulator and the the game itself and it reciprocates the whole game so i can tell the game to do something and tell it to be this difficulty setting i can i even change some of the ways it does display and all stuff so that it can accommodate all this oh that's super smart i love that stuff so there's a super chat over something that i was going to mention so we could talk a bit about it but the uh... Cafe Man sends five dollars and says, "Air World Talk is is it any more fun than the OG Sword Quest Sword Quest games?" So yeah, we should talk about this because there's a, there's a story to these games, right? <laughs> yeah, Sword Quest is one of those things that came out near the oh, end yeah, of the Atari's yeah. life cycle. Yeah, and it was they were made by Todd Fry, 
Uh, I think even even early on before that, there was like uh, a lot of Atari really wanted to make a sequel to Adventure, and so mm-hmm. Todd came up with this idea of doing multiple games with comic books and there's puzzles and all stuff, and with very varying degrees of success and execution on them um, from his own admission. Um, but I was enamored with them. I loved the comics. I loved the how obscure everything was in the game. Like it's really not like any game I played before. And I was just, I felt like I was left hanging when the final game never came out. Yeah. And uh, so it's the quest was never complete. And so it's 37 years later when we're talking about doing this. One of the first things I really wanted to do was like, as long as we can finish the Sword Quest series, I'm in. And so um, they, they, let, they, they said, go ahead. And Dave Reese, uh, again, who helped me out with the Star Raider stuff and the control inputs, he jumped on it and just started building it. And it's, it's not a real Atari 2600 ROM where we, we built it in our in bake sale. Uh, with limitations kind of mostly thrown at it, with the intent that maybe we go back and we actually make it a real Atari game. So the goal mm. was let's do things that we can do on the Atari. Um, some things might be a little bit extra or whatever, but like let's try to keep close so that should the time come, it'd be great to be able to do that too. Was That's there awesome. any specific reason why you decided to not make it on Atari hardware, so to speak, like to homebrew it basically? Time. <laughs> Time? Okay, it, yeah, we, yeah this, the schedule, believe it or not, the production schedule on this was pretty short. I mean, it was yeah. probably at like short, 10 months is short for something like this, as big as it is. Mm-hmm. And so we hit the ground running and just worked really hard. Wow. Put everything we could in here. And um, in that time, we had to make you know certain bets where it's like, okay, if we're going to do Air World, if we're going to do it 2600, that's going to take three to four times as long as if we just do it natively. Um, mm. so that, that's the reason we approach it. But the reason we put the limitation on it, of course, too, is that we kind of want to do it. And so, um, when that opportunity kind of comes up, we, we'd love to, to do that. And does it play like the originals? We tried to, cause we knew that like Todd, we had some notes from Todd that it was going to be like the I Ching, if I'm saying it correctly, I Ching Ching, um, mm. I Ching, I don't know. But, um, however, like that was the, the, the approach they wanted to do and uh the todd wanted to do so we we went from that and extrapolated what would that sword quest game kind of look like but we also kind of followed a, a few of the more modern kind of contexts like flappy bird that kind of thing to kind of make the mini games cool oh man this this link stuff uh whew. i actually do have a links that was always such a fascinating machine with its hardware it's it's have you actually worked on the links then i guess is a question i have yeah, so that wow. was one that of course. I, I actually, <laughs> I, I don't have anything released, but I had the development manual, some of the hardware, okay. and I was just kind of goofing around with it, and it's like a spiritual successor to the Amiga, so there's a lot of similarities, because R.J. Michael is like a through line, if you think about it, for all these things, like oh, 3 yeah, yeah, the right. Lynx, the yep, Amiga. Yep, yep. Um, that's true. And so it was really easy to get things kind of up and running. But when Once an emulator was available that somebody had created, um, I was able to like take every, all the information I had to... To build some stuff so i had just some boxes moving around a little shooter that sort of thing but like the hardware is incredibly capable for the time and i remember oh, even yeah. back then being like how is this not winning the handheld game war because <laughs> it has everything going for it uh, but then again the games just weren't as compelling as no. nintendo's well i think yeah. part of the problem there is that nintendo ultimately had western and japanese uh developers on board whereas atari really struggled to get anything outside of america right and maybe yeah. the interestingly UK. enough Lynx does have a uh, ninja gaiden but it's not made by a japanese team no it is not but it does have it so there's like at least in the japanese ip on it yeah but i i think that's also weird the thing about the Lynx is it does all this advanced scaling tons of features like that with its blitter i guess but uh for a side scrolling game there is not a single Lynx game that runs at 60 frames per second or at that level, right? And that's actually pretty common on the Game Boy. Uh, yeah. So the Lynx games could look a lot more impressive, but they tended not to run as smoothly, I found. And the screen yeah, res a, is really low. <laughs> I think a lot of the games are actually written in C for it. Oh, man. So that, that makes so, me wonder what could have been done. Yeah, I think there's a lot more that can happen with the Lynx. Uh, and you think about Game Boy, Z80 was the way to go. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like, All I assembly. Was, learning my chops on Game Boy going like I, I realized I was using an emulator to make Game Boy games and like I've got this super fast scrolling like it's like Sonic and then I put on a real Game Boy and it's just a blur it's like oh mm-hmm. I gotta slow it oh, down like yeah, the, the yeah. limitation on the Game Boy was like slow it down or don't move the camera so fast or the, the screen um, but Lynx I think it had a lot more room to go but nobody nobody took advantage of that 
Yeah, Although the uh, the Shadow of the Beast port was always pretty impressive on there, with all that yeah. parallax scrolling and everything, they they really brought it to the links nicely. It's a good yeah, thing. So... I wouldn't doubt that's an assembly. Uh, probably. Yeah. What about we look... one more? Go ahead. I'll let you in a second, Audi. But I, I got to yeah. ask one more question here because I'm excited. <laughs> so you have the border here of the links two. Was there any debate in the office as to like, all right, which border should we do, links one or links two? <laughs> originally, we had we had links one mm, originally okay. that's what we wanted to have and all the photography all the cleanup on it all the stuff just does, wasn't working really well it's, that, it's, it's paint, hard to find right? a clean one yeah, yeah the, paint the paint on that thing is awful the light <laughs> reflects terribly off of it like it looks hollow and like it just looks yeah. so cheap so we're like yeah. all right let's go to the links two it's like it was a hail mary in the end we're like we're not getting any good photography of the links one and then the almost like the first shot we took of the links two just looked good and we're like all right here we go <laughs> we're links gonna use two. this one <laughs> Let's do it is. There, there it is. Look at that. That thing's a chunky boy. It really is it's chunky. A, it's a neat. It's a neat thing though. I like this links. The yeah, D-pad like, is really like weird though. It. Yeah, it's, it's large and flat, but still. <laughs> oh man. Anyway, go ahead, Audie. No, I was just gonna say. Talk, we were talking about impressive link stuff, and I remember we were, when we did the Mortal Kombat episode of DF Retro, we looked at that. There's like a Lynx um, homebrew of Mortal Kombat 1, right? Oh, yeah. Um, that's that's right. pretty impressive. Um, and at JAGFest, uh, the number one Jaguar festival in the world, uh, held in Germany, uh, there was also a Lynx kind of portion to that uh, yeah. oh, convention. Yeah, that's right. Tons of people doing like homebrews for it. We were playing quite a lot of... There was one of Another World... Or like a, yeah. an offshoot of another world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, There's an RPG on impressive. there somebody made. It was an RPG. Uh, we played, uh, what was it, 16-player checkered no, flag? it was eight. We did eight-player eight? okay. uh, checkered flag. <laughs> so that we had a contest at Jegfest. You have eight lynxes all linked up with that cable, and it was right. just checkered flag, baby. And it was, uh, it was a it was lot fun. of fun. It was, it was really good, fun. Yeah. I think the, it was eight at, players, right? I think it was eight players, yeah. I think so. I think, yeah, it I was it's the whatever max, maximum. But, yeah. Uh, when I was at the Portland Gaming Expo with Mike, actually, uh, a month or so ago, there was a group of people uh, at the uh, Video Game History Foundation. They were playing Faceball 2000 on Game Boy with the link cable. And it was oh, like man. attempting to do a set of record or something for the most people who played it. Uh, but they had a lot of fun. Derek was there from uh, Stop Skeleton from Fighting. Oh, that's cool. Uh, so, yeah, they seem to have a lot of fun. Uh, oh, man. There's, all, there's a lot of fun to be at. Look, look at this shot game. real quick. This this, this shot, this promo yeah. shot for the Jaguar. They've got the Jaguar, like, sitting on some sort of object, so it's tilted slightly up so the camera mm. can see the console. I love this stuff. This guy's really Is he looking rules. at the TV, though? He's looking at something else. Uh, he's like side-eyeing Cybermorph, but also mm. looking at the Jag. But he's got his links mm. up there. Probably looking That's at great. the uh, photographers. Like They're trying to get him to show some emotions. They have like pizza off camera. And he's all getting yeah. excited. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. We got uh, a visitor back here. Uh, oh, you're hiding. It's okay. Anyway, go ahead. Jaguar. Somebody say Jaguar? <laughs> <He> brings, <laughs> brings them all. Brings, brings all the kids. <laughs> Uh, someone was asking if there was a Bubsy made for the Lynx. Uh, there was never a Bubsy for Lynx. There was never announced a Bubsy for Lynx. Uh, they announced a remake or a port of Bubsy 1 for the Jaguar. And they hit the snafu with that. I'm guessing the scrolling. Uh, and then the decision was made because they had announced or they had the promise of a Bubsy on Jaguar. That they made a whole new game. Which was Bubsy's Fairy Tales. So. Yeah, and it's uh, not the best. It's, it's probably yeah, the, that is, is it... not the best Bubsy game. No, that's for sure. Actually, thinking of that, so when you're mapping these controls, the Jaguar has that giant keypad at the bottom. And one thing shared across every Jaguar game I found was that the zero key turns off the music. Did you consider putting the music <laughs> off button on the controllers? <laughs> We were just having a bit of a discussion about this, actually, because, uh, you know, for, for everybody who wants, like, it's funny, you put something like this out, and you think you're making, you know, you're making all these different decisions as you're going through, you're like, okay, you can turn the game volume down, or you can do whatever, maybe you don't need that button or whatever, but then, sure enough, somebody will always say, you know, if you turn the volume off and then do this thing in the game, it makes this thing happen, and it's like, God, we should have just supported the volume music <laughs> switch, and so, so, 
with with updates we're trying to address all that kind of stuff but like oh i don't gosh. know specifically about the volume whether we're doing that or not but uh i'm sure there's some reason to and if there is we're gonna we're gonna do it <laughs> I never understood the reason either, Rem. All right, no. But... <laughs> uh, but that was something I always wondered about with the Jaguars, why they had the zero button turn off the music. Like, what a strange thing. It's just every game had that. It's like Nothing says, like, I don't have button. confidence in our, the quality of our music, then, like, you can just turn it off. <laughs> just turn it off in every, every game. 3DO had the headphone jack. Jaguars got the off button. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is the best Jaguar game soundtrack? I mean, I guess it is Tempest. It's probably Tempest. I'd yeah. say Tempest 2000, just because it's, it's, it's the one be. I can remember. Yeah, and I played them all, and like that one just like always stuck out. And of course, I bought the CD for it and everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm looking at my collection, and I can't. I mean, Zool is okay. Zool Two. It's fine. Uh, it's very Amiga. Club Drive has that weird, almost like the do, do, do. Uh, Goat Simulator kind of soundtrack. Do, 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 do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think Power yeah, Drive is okay. Yeah, Power Drive Power is pretty Valley. good. Yeah, yeah. that one's good. I mean, AVP's yeah. got a nice atmospheric soundscape. You yeah. could say mm-hmm. that's pretty good. What's the uh, What's the other game from Rebellion? I have that box copy of it. Uh, Skyhammer. Skyhammer. Sky yeah. Hammer, yeah. That's an interesting one as well. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I mean, that, that was, was like, an aftermarket game. Yeah, but it was in development, I think, during right, the life yeah. of the Jag. It just came out later. Yeah. Uh, like a lot of Jag stuff. Yeah. You, uh, being that you are producing these collections such, uh, Mike, do you still keep up with like the community now in terms of aftermarket release and stuff? Because for the Jaguar, there's been a lot of aftermarket releases, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, personally, my my wallet hates me for it because these things I, <laughs> yeah. I can't say no to a lot of the right. stuff. It's like, yeah, I want to play Chaos Engine on the Jaguar. Why not? Yeah, well, like, another world? I'll buy like my 40th copy of Another World for whatever reason. Like I'll do all those <laughs> things for because me. I just I'm fascinated by the differences or seeing if the platform can do it. It's and that's a, a lot of the reason why like um, Chris Culler, Dan Amrick, and guys on the editorial team, we've included a good example is like we included the Atari XE version of Food Fight versus the arcade Food Fight. Oh, yes, um, I love that. And a lot of people are like, why would you put the horrible XE version on here? And it's all context. It's like, yep, right, one yep. of the things that we always, when we we're growing up with this, it's like, you would look at somebody else's version of a game going like, I can't mind be doing that good or whatever. It's like, want a little bit of that in there, too. And th- they made the call to do a bit of that, too, which was see that, kind of cool to see. That's the kind of thing is I, I would like to see every version of every game that's in a collection when possible, you know? Just, yeah. Because it a lot of these games just have so many ports and a lot of the ports are terrible, but they're interesting in the context of when they were released. Right. I and agree I, with you. Like we're getting blowback on how many copies of asteroids and breakout are in the collection, but like we wanted to do oh, that man. with everything. It's just time yeah. ran out. Right. But it's like, yeah, yeah. It's, but then people like yourself and a lot of others, of course, support it and really enjoy that. But yeah, I would love everything. Uh, like to me, it's like everything, put it all in. Even if we put mm. it all aside, like here's all the other versions you can go dial into. That'd be amazing. Absolutely. That makes such a difference. Oh man! People are coming into the chat with other soundtrack suggestions, and I do agree. Oh, yeah. uh, so What's... one was uh, Defender 2000. Oh, uh, yeah. oh yeah, that was pretty good. That's and pretty Dragon good. Bruce Lee story. I forgot about that. I love the music yep. in that game for the various versions of it. It's not the best game, uh, but I do like the sound design. Of That's Dragon an okay. Bruce Lee story. It's an okay port of Dragon as well. It's not bad. It has it's one of the better kind of ports that were made for Jaguar because it has uh, brand new backgrounds. Yeah. Um, pretty fluid animation still that compares to the Mega Drive and Super Nintendo. I would say so, the the best Jaguar conversion, and it came late as you guys just mentioned, is Another World because it's basically like the anniversary edition, but running at its original like 240p resolution. Yes, that's a very it's interesting so good. port. It's it's such such a good port. I don't Absolutely know. Absolutely fantastic. I don't know for you, Mike, how important that game was, but I mention it every time I'm on Digital Foundry. But Another World was the game that made me decide to go into video games when I played in '92. I, from that point on. I said, oh, like, man. I want to make video games because Another World was just such a man. It was an experience. One of my favorite games of all time. Like, it's Same. in my top. Yeah. Like, I, I don't even know where to put it in the top five or top ten at least. Like, but it's it's, it's so high up there that like I I it was a miracle to see it moving. Uh, there were two yeah. moments like that uh, in my game career that I can remember, or not game career, just like being a game fan. 
that mm. I can remember that stood out really well were uh, Karataka. When I first saw yeah, that Karateka, depending on how you say it. <laughs> uh, everybody says it differently. Uh, seeing a game be cinematic, but still a game, blew my mind. And then I thought it could that couldn't be bested for a long time. And then out of nowhere comes another world out of this world. Yeah. And I just... Okay, there's a few reasons to be blown away by it. One, it just it's amazing. It moves amazing. And just what you're seeing is something you never expected from a machine. Oh, yeah. But at the same time, it all fit on a floppy. This whole world, <laughs> this game that felt like it was like too big to fit on a floppy. You just sit there and look at the floppy like, how do you fit on this? It was insane. And like Eric Chehi just managed to do a pull a miracle off and it was just a, a matter of just having somebody think of the best way to pull pull that off like he was basically creating flash for his game and gb was it like a gw basic or it was on amiga mm. and yeah. uh, he created a tool to, to basically do flash and that's yeah. how he was able to compress it all it's just mind-boggling and the the creature design the atmosphere oh yeah 16 colors how how could you possibly pull off a world like this with 16 colors he did it and it's just it's remarkable. It's a masterclass yeah. of minimalism. It's just the, your, yeah. your mind fills in so much that it just takes over that world. And the game itself is so understated to the point where the experience becomes so powerful. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, man. I If I ever met Eric Chahi, I would cry. Uh, it's, that, <laughs> um, it's that much of a thing for me. Yep. But uh, I've never been able to meet him, unfortunately. So that was like, people always say, can games make you cry? Like, that's one that got me so close because that ending is just so oh, amazing. Yeah. You're, oh, you just yeah. feel like, you know, you're ready to just give up and then here comes your buddy. It's like the coolest thing. And, and then, then yeah, that sequel. Oh, and then there's alien. a sequel. Uh, they didn't really get... <laughs> and that one's totally different because that actually uses like sprites. It's like sprite normal based. sprites yeah. instead mm -hmm. of like, it's, they really didn't understand what they were doing with that one. But still, I have it. I would love not. to make a another world museum piece you know like kind of like every version of it uh all this context because that was the i mean this has now become the another world stream but yeah. uh you know that was a game that chahi created it and then interplay tried for each version they released tried to take over the yep. game add elements that didn't fit in but they fought they knew better and, and by the time never... you get to 3DO, you know, the 3DO version is completely by Interplay and Chahi had nothing to do with it. Yeah. And that's the, I hate that version. It's yeah. It has the awful music, awful background. It just ruins the entire experience. And you can clearly see why Chahi fought them so much. Yeah. Um, and and he then he lost on that one. He didn't lose. He had moved on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so <laughs> he gave up the fight that... to move on to different pastures. Heart of Darkness. Heart of, heart, heart of Darkness, yeah. yeah. Which is another game that definitely. I needs, love it. It's great. Yeah, yeah, it needs I like a remaster. It too. Yeah. To, like, where are those assets? You know, it was all hand drawn, and uh, I would love to know where part of darkness now resides. There'd be an interesting thing to China. do with that game. Yeah, because like you could leave it as is for the purists, but like imagine yeah. just the CG sequences being mm -hmm. remastered, but keep yep. that beautiful two D artwork because yeah. yeah, the game looked now like in hindsight a lot of people were so enamored with like cg early cg that yeah. those sequences were kind of like neat on a playstation or pc mm -hmm. but now when you look at it you're like oh they're the worst parts of this because the game looks so beautiful and those yeah. parts look really weak the, and it'd be amazing part, to see yeah. what happen match it up yeah. with 2d animation or whatever to, to kind of keep it all consistent but yeah, yeah the music bruce was it bruce broughton broughton whatever and uh, it was an amazing collection of talent in that game I feel yeah. like with, with those games like that, it would be a really great opportunity to have, because it's screen by screen, you could actually like pause at certain screens and really try to do commentary and like maybe bring in video on top of it and basically yeah. have somebody talk you through each screen and like what they were thinking for this puzzle and get some real insight into that stuff. It's I would like listen to five hours of somebody just talking how the shadows work. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Battle Morph. Didn't know there was a sequel to Cyromorph. There certainly is. Oh yeah, on the CD. That's uh, that's quite a thing, I would say. Battle Morph. <laughs> you know what else we need to bring back, Mike? Is the new one. You know. Oh yeah, oh, the, oh, man. The uh, sequel yeah. to the Jaguar. <laughs> the, 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 yeah, I, the unofficial would, sequel to the Jaguar. I would love to at least get Tempest out of uh, game jail from that, as well as uh, the sequel yeah. to Atari Karts. Is Merlin yeah, Racing? Merlin yeah. Racing, baby. Merlin yeah. Racing, which is there's also quite good. Uh, uh, Free the Fall, mech, the Mech game. Yeah. Uh, there's a sequel to that on there. Iron as well. Soldier. Iron well, Soldier, Iron Soldier yeah. Three, I think. Three, yeah. it's three. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Hey, somebody yeah. at Jagfest, uh, Nick, he made that gigantic like mechanical track ball with all like metal casing just yes. for the new on with that weird yeah. encoder chip in it and everything. It's amazing. Yeah, to play Tempest. It was, when uh, I was, at, it was uh, something. When I was at Next Gen Magazine, um, that was my beat was trying to get any of the new on news when it was like the new <laughs> oh. was coming. Oh, it was yeah. so hard. I remember getting a hold of Toshiba and Toshiba just being like, yeah. To support like Nuon or whatever, and it's like, what model are you gonna put it in? They sent me a photo of like what the thing was gonna be, so we used that on the cover with like, here's PlayStation, here's N64, here's, and then here's the Nuon. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, really challenging to get any information out of that place. Yeah, what a weird machine. So look at I, all this like video the... footage because that's something that's really special about this collection is everything yeah. you track down and filmed mm -hmm. for it, right? Yeah, yeah, we actually we filmed all new video. Yeah. For that. Yeah, and, and like uh, we have we have a studio we built out in this here in the office where we brought people in to do all those interviews. So we had like Todd and those guys kind of come in and yeah. get down. We got a lot of footage, and then we're just hoping for a good edit out of all that. Yeah, you were showing me at Portland. You were showing me like this news clip. It was like black and white, right? Of uh, I think it was Nolan and it's like first endeavors with video games. Oh, yes, yeah, exactly. Like there was a somewhere on Facebook I had seen. Yeah. Um, Great historian, this uh, game historian, this guy, Marty Goldberg, had posted some video of it. And I tried reaching out to him, but it was like odd timing and everything. And I was just like, I got to get this video. I got to get this video. And then I um, reached out to, I don't know if you guys know Catherine Despira, who does a lot mm -hmm. of great uh, game journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, she was able to kind of track down one of the um, students who worked on the film, who now is like a uh, basically a licensing lawyer in Hollywood. And so with that and also reaching out to Marty, we were able to kind of get everything sorted out to include this. And it was, it was made in 1973. And I thought it'd be an incredible bookend to have Nolan now and Nolan when it's still called Syzygy back yeah, then. It, yeah. looks like a, it looks like a baby like with huge mutton chops. Like <laughs> have those, those two different bookends on there. And, and I thought that was a, a really cool arc for the, for the whole story. And Marty had got the video from Ralph Bear and it was a video that was used, I think, in the uh, Atari versus Magnavox for um, their Pong versus basically Odyssey. And so this yeah. was like something from that was used in court. <laughs> it, you know, it's so this is so special what you're mentioning here with bookending and having these people available because uh, I mentioned on this show a few times before in other videos that I worked quite extensively in Japan with preservation for PC98 and the, oh, these yeah. computers and written books and whatnot. And the problem that we were facing a lot with that community and in general in gaming, as we're, you know, we're now, uh, you know, half a day, uh, you know, 50 years into video gaming, if not more, a lot of people are leaving us and those stories yeah. are disappearing and they haven't been told until fairly recently. You know, preservation and context and history hasn't really been valued in video gaming uh, no, as a mainstream thing, you know, until... 2010 and upwards i'd say and so it's so frustrating and so sad sometimes when i worked in japan and i was going down these um streets so to speak uh trying to find people and then only to discover that they're no longer with us and those stories yeah. can't be told because they're not there uh with atari you were so lucky now that you get to do this and you get to have that book that's right yeah it was, important. it was remarkable because like yeah. we went to probably one of the last there, there was an Atari 50th reunion uh, in the South Bay. There was a big picnic where everybody from the arcade division got together. And so you had, like, no one was there. Eugene Jarvis was there. This is after we were done and we put this to bed. I really, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, if we can only get all this footage in. Yeah, but, like, we realized when we were there that this is really a personal moment for everybody. We yeah. shouldn't really use this as a something we need to, to, to capture. And there was, of course, video taken and all that stuff, but... We decided not to use that for marketing, not to use any stuff because That's cool. it was just such an amazing event. After going through this project, hearing all their stories, then to be there and see them all in person, and you know, everybody's it's that was a long time ago, and like they all made an effort to get together for this, you know, fiftieth landmark that was just mind boggling. And hearing the stories even then, that I was kind of or like let's archive this stuff, let's just keep it because someday this will be good to have for anything that we we're not anticipating right now. And so we've yeah. been trying to get in that mindset of like capture interviews, get as many as we want. Even if we don't have a product right now, get as much as we can because this just needs to be saved. Yeah, that's good. Uh, 
thinking of saving things this here the fly the theater theatrical commercial <laughs> how where did you source this this is is this original film stock or something yeah so the the firm that created that and several of the atari commercials that are included here uh we reached out to them ultimately like again the editorial team did great work here because it had been mentioned in one of the atari age magazines back in the day that you get in the mail and yeah. they did a they, you have it in the the collection we show the, yeah, yeah. the the, the making of it. Yeah. And so just on a whim, it's like, let's try to get a hold of these guys. And see, and they, they still had the materials. So we're able to get these in here in a way that wasn't like chunky YouTube videos. Uh, and a, but a, the best quality you can possibly get these right now. And so that was just another amazing get that you don't really know going in if you can get it. But right. during the whole project, again, it's like an archaeological dig. You just keep hoping that there's something there that you can get. And we yeah. got very lucky and fortunate with some of this. Yeah, I, incredible footage. Seeing this again, it's just like wow, this is such an incredible piece they did back then. Yeah, with those, with those early computer graphics and everything, it's a uh, it's quite an atmospheric commercial, I would say. Yeah, I can only I never saw this in the theater, so for me it was just kind of like, all yeah, right, me neither. Like, <laughs> I would love to see this on the big screen right now. <laughs> yeah, this is just wow, it's such a cool thing. And doing this kind of work, though, back in the early 80s, I guess, the CGI stuff, it was so difficult. Yeah. So this must have cost a fortune to make this commercial. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at it. It's like Tron era graphics yeah. that like probably cost way too much. Absolutely. Yeah. John had, uh, he did an interview with one of the people who worked on Tron, the original. Uh, yeah, that's right. Who, who did the effects. And he was talking about just how, you know, Bill how long it took to rend yeah, how long it took to render out just like a few seconds of film. And yeah, then... so what what Bill told me in that interview was uh that basically they had to plot points mathematically without actually mm -hmm. being able to see the graphics. So oh, it's wow. right. just writing down all the coordinates of all like the, the geometry that's gonna appear in the scene, you send it off, and then a week later you get back the results of what you did, and they only had enough budget to like redo that like once or twice per shot. So mm -hmm. they had to be really sure about the exact <laughs> coordinates of everything before sending it in. And that's how they did the CGI in that movie, which is uh it sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> 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 but the the results are still to this day, I think, still amazing. And the, there's also other technology like Scanimate and all these yep. things, like weird analog processes that made just that era look crazy. And like that Tron look, I still like revere. It's amazing. So Howard Scott Warshaw. Yeah, and this is this is of course for people watching. This is one of the things that makes this collection so special is all these mm -hmm. brand new interviews with uh, classic creators talking about special moments throughout their career and, you know, all kinds of random questions. It's fantastic. And this is the context you get. There was one video at some point on Twitter and it's in the game, so I can mention it, but it's like, it's an editing point where someone say, says something to the extent of like, oh, there was no funny business. You know, we were just kind of doing our job and then it just edits straight to someone else saying, yes, I did some cocaine, smoked some weed. <laughs> And then, you know, made the game. and uh, That's Todd Fry, who's become, yeah. <laughs> yeah. become kind of a hero out of this, because <laughs> so many people have been like, I want to I wanna smoke pot with Todd. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's who Todd is. Like, you hear the two sides, because like, David mm -hmm. Crane and his crew were in the buttoned-up building doing their work. Then you have like Howard and Todd in the other building, or, like the hippie building, and they were just like going crazy in what they were doing. And like Todd tells stories about how he played the Colonel for Xevious for the 2600. And he's just like, took a little, like, you know, cocaine, little psilocybin, little whatever. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> then it came forth in my mind exactly how to make this game work on the Atari. <laughs> it's really good to see that uh, this stuff is now being officially acknowledged. That's That's one of the best parts <laughs> of this. It's like, you hear all the stories, but, you know, having them come out and talk about this stuff directly in the collection, perfect. I must say, oh, though, like the game dev has it. changed. Uh, we yeah. uh, we do not do uh, much cocaine, unfortunately, yeah. on our game developments. Let's bring uh, it back. That's a, yeah, that's a, <laughs> this, is a, this is the catalyst for us bringing it back. <laughs> yeah. Make our best work. <laughs> uh, oh, my gosh. Uh, let's see. Was there any other questions? I haven't looked. Sorry, I've been having so much fun that I didn't really read. Absolutely. Uh, let me try catch up a little bit. 
Uh, someone's, uh, there's been a few questions. I don't know if uh, oh, Digital yeah. Clips have answered it in the chat, but uh, someone's asking if you are planning on or thought about doing DLC for the game. It really comes down to, I mean, it's just the, like the stock answer, but like if it does well enough, there's no reason not to, because I think yeah. that means we can reinvest in the product uh, once we've kind of recovered from it and and put more out there. And we'd, we'd love to do it. I know Atari would love to do it. Uh, it's just a matter of like seeing what the results would be. And what, mm -hmm. and also on top of that, that's setting it up. But then what can we get? Because we put yeah. a lot in here. We know we can get like more 2600. We get more of that stuff. But what are some of those like big gets that we might be able to, to go after? Like that, Kung that Food on the links? Kung Food. The the number one requested <laughs> game on the links, Kung Food, sure. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I'm sure uh, you another... can't get the Bill and Ted license, unfortunately, for that yeah, well, exceptional well. game. <laughs> a, a different company has that license, John. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know. <laughs> also a nightmare with five bucks. Uh, hard to overstate how fantastic the artwork of this era was. Generating images you'd project on into the game in the places where pixels couldn't. And uh, I mean, yeah, Absolutely. Atari art in general, like the box art, like stuff like that, it's just, it's so iconic, right? It so, is. I got it's Cliff Spawn. Um, I wish I had everybody's names here because I, I'm totally flubbing this, but like uh, that whole group of artists, uh, like mm -hmm. these men and women who worked on just the most amazing visuals that you buy the game and like on your way home in the car ride, you're looking at these visuals and in your head, you're just, taking stock of what the world was and when you sat down and started playing the game that was all there and it was filling in yeah, those gaps like, kind of like out of this world and another mm -hmm. world like, <laughs> that you, you were just kind of filling those gaps it's what you would do but you had this like amazing reference art um, yeah and that's why we've showcased it so much here we you know at the time we didn't have anything else to compare it to that was graphics and so that yeah. artwork you know influenced a lot of our imagination when playing those games so it's like a canvas in that way and you just have some yeah. uh, inspiration from the artwork so it looks silly i think to people today when you pick like when you look at the atari art it's like all oh, this spaceship with all these monsters blah 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 and the game itself is just a few blocks and a black background but it's like <laughs> no no those monsters and that spaceship that's that was on the screen for me when i played yeah. it back then so so that that's actually i've really thought about this a lot and one of the things that you really contributed to it i always profess my love of crts but that <laughs> that inky blackness like staring into that glass tube there's a look yeah. to it with the phosphors it's so different from what like an lcd panel looks like that with those simple you know black screen games whether it's arcade home computers there's something really like hard to explain about it it's like this magical feeling of staring into that tube that yeah. it's really hard to replicate but it's it's really special it is it feels vast yeah, and, it uh, really does. Like, and the reason we kind of did the bezels the way we did it was to help with that contrast. We totally recognize that that black needs something to play off of. Yeah. And so while you know a lot of people like to shut off bezels and do that sort of thing, our, our goal for these were to try to give that contrast so you did still have that sense of that. Yeah. This is probably the first collection I've left bezels enabled on, I, I should note. So <laughs> success. I always feel good when I hear that because a lot of people have been saying that. I'm like, yes. We really I always turn them on. off. But this time they're they're really good. It, yeah. it really does add a lot to it, I think. It's great. You know, it's not just a border in the sense that, like, it feels left and right. right. And uh, it for the, actually enhances the experience. For our viewers at home, I've turned off the filter because on a scaled YouTube video, these kind of filters like this don't look great. Right. So yeah. for streaming, you want that off, but I actually do recommend the TV filters and all the different line filters in here. Really, really good. And it adds a lot to the presentation. Yeah, someone right. was asking about it earlier, and I was going to actually mention that for streaming, yeah, it doesn't translate. Can... Nope, you want. Yeah. But we we both discussed that we actually do use it in this game, which again, usually we turn all that stuff off. Uh, but on Atari Fifty, we've left everything on, so uh, absolutely, we, we wholly uh, recommend oh, man. leaving everything on. The Sword Quest yeah, art. Look at that. <laughs> so, Mike, what is, is the kind of one thing when you were doing this game and? talking to all these people interviewing them discovering these stories what's the one story that you discover that you kind of love the most um, well, that's, a <laughs> <laughs> that's a tough one because uh it, it's it's probably 
it's it's the common one everybody loves and it's been overdone and everything like that but i really like hearing everybody not because of the story itself but like the the different perspectives people had on the pong crash mm. story oh yeah it was really fun to hear everybody's like if it's real if it's true if it's because it's such a legend that like you've always heard it was this is what happened but i loved having like david crane uh even tim schaefer and everybody say if it's true <laughs> like it's always mm. a Always a grain of salt with this sort of thing. I like that because I'd heard so many other stories, and I've got so many that like, so many stories over the years that you know over drinks that will probably never come out. But like, all those <laughs> are just like crazy stories. And then this one was sure it sounds bland. It sounds like typical, but I really like that one. Yeah. And it's almost asking if you can add dip switches to the arcade games. Hmm. They're not the first. I think mm -hmm. um, we're we're looking at that right now. Like when we put this together, we're just kind of like. Because it's the style of the way it is, we had anticipated that people can come in and play these games a little bit, set them to whatever is like the what would be deemed like a default. Um, but now we're hitting getting so many people who actually want to play, like go deeper into these games, makes sense. So we're looking at that right now. I don't know if and when, but um, it's, it's being explored. Oh, there it is. That wait, I didn't realize the seventy eight hundred had a joypad. That's interesting. <laughs> That's like the, uh, that was one of their computers had that same pad, didn't it? I don't know if you can see what I'm looking I at, Mike. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah, I forgot. Maybe it was an XE pad, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, it, that's pretty, what I, uh, it feels like. the. I think it's like the XE pad, but like white, like a, the off-white color, that grayish plastic instead. That looks very familiar. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I never actually had a 5200 or 7800, but my first console was also the 2600. Played on a black and white TV, no less. Same here. So, I had a black and white TV for so like much. a year. Yep. And uh, when I, we finally hooked up to the color TV, it was just like Wizard of Oz. Like, what? Like, there's exactly. a whole new thing. <laughs> Man, so much pitfall in there. Yeah. So, so last, I guess last question for you, because we are coming up yeah. on an hour and a half here. But uh, what is yeah, your yeah. favorite game on this collection, Mike? On this collection, it'd probably be... I'm gonna cheat and say it's two favorite games right now, just off All the right. top of my head. I would, I would say so many other things, but I think it's gonna be Yars Revenge and it's gonna be um, Star Raiders. Those two are like so All are right. just huge in my head. I spent so much time as a kid, and so going at it, that's the reason I did the enhanced Yars Revenge and the enhanced Star Raiders. Is like I want people to really like these games. Oh yeah, and the, so I went for that. Those enhanced versions are really cool, by the way. We actually really... didn't get that far today. No. We can take a look yeah, at one of them before we. Uh, Inclu off. Including this thing, I can't believe you put the touch <laughs> me game in there. And that's Jason Cirillo, crazy. who who also did the Neo Breakout. He's a huge handheld fan, and he's like, "We have to have touch me in this." So he was hell bent on making sure we got it in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, these reimaginings, man, these are absolutely awesome. Yeah. Thanks really really cool i like how you realize that shield barrier there because mm -hmm. it just looks like a it always has this kind of garbled pixel look to it but yep. seeing it sort of brought with this 3d tube structure it really it's awesome i love it if you hit the right oh, I think it's the right bumper will switch if you yeah. hit that yeah, oh yeah. yeah look at that oh so man. you can see what it looks like in flight and that's the real game running and so this reimagined version is just doing exactly what we're talking about before with star raiders we're just looking yeah. at the ram and drawing everything and Howard had put all the granular movement in there. So it moves really smooth on a modern rendering pipeline. But then That's in the original sick. game, it's it's left to the kernel of 2600. Right, right. Yeah. Wow, that's so cool. That garbled stuff, that's actually the source code in the original game, right? Or something like this? Yeah, so that, that yeah. essentially is the source code of Yars Revenge telling you right. what colors to use. Yeah. Uh, there was the... Over the stream, it's like 60 hertz and it flickers. So you won't, you won't see that shield sometimes when you switch because of the oh frame yeah, yeah 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 uh, there is a last super chat here uh from michael bjork 10 10 bucks finally a place to play jaguar games as a kiddo i dreamed of my parents getting me a 600 dollars 64-bit machine thanks mike for helping make make it accessible <laughs> and john naughty great stream as always for so, far less yeah, money so. you're welcome much less money oh, yeah. you can have much, much less before we leave let's check uh vector sector i think it is like the what's vector the sector? one yeah we we're talking about the... vectors at the beginning it's a vector sector so go all the way to the oh yeah so it's yeah, under arcade let's scroll down here go back up to the left no that not that arcade it's in reimagined so back up oh reimagined. yeah it's a reimagined oh, one yep. 
Yeah, there you go. Oh, uh, there, there it is. You go, yeah. This, this one. is a this is a favorite for a lot of people. It's yeah, it's this um, is... amalgamation. Ooh, I haven't of, tried like, this one yet. Atari Vector games. Oh, this is the most fun I've had. Okay, uh, I haven't tried so... this one yet. This looks sick. Twin stick shooter controls. You go ahead oh and do gosh. all of them that they're suggesting, and then I think some of the the, the biggest oohs and ahs are probably in this one with the transitions that it has because mm -hmm. it really takes you on a like a tour of all the games. Yeah. Uh, well, not all the games, but like some choice games. And um, I, oh this is about, again Jeremy Williams. He this is what he wanted to work on. Loves vector games. Wanted to try to <laughs> capture the feel of a vector game, and uh, he definitely did a remarkable job here. It's such a good game, man. Oh my gosh, it, you're it, right. Look the, at that. The whole, the whole collection is if worth it just for this, like, <laughs> playing this game. Wow. You get okay. so much more, but I love this one. I and hadn't gotten to this yet. This is so, this is insane. Yeah, we did. We made an arcade cabinet. Jeremy actually commissioned uh, uh, somebody here local who makes these incredible cabinets and had them create a vector oh. sector cabinet for the California Extreme Arcade Show. And so we had that at yeah. the last California Extreme Show. That's uh, so and, cool. Jeremy and I worked close close to years ago um, with Sean Charlesworth and the folks over at Tested.com on doing a, an arcade game called Star Lords. Oh, that's, that's kind of the fast. beginning of um, kind of our our game development uh, relationship, and this is kind of the the latest of that. Which Jeremy just knocked it out of the park. Absolutely, yeah. wow. I'll have to come play that uh, cabinet at your office sometime. Yep. So now someone was asking the true last question, Mike. What do you know about Polybius? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know it's, if you can if, say if, you know that's like there's a lot more I have a family I can't like yeah. put anybody in jeopardy can't put them in jeopardy <laughs> no and so really that's kind of how I have to kind of leave it and like uh, but <laughs> truth be known there's there's more actors in that than you think of uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot of I think you know people talk to Ed Rotberg a lot about stuff and I don't think he's telling the whole truth mm. <laughs> there's a good video from Ahoy on the subject oh, if yeah. you're interested in Polybius that's all right, that. all right. I just love Oof. that it's probably some marketing guy. I love that the <laughs> legends kind of got there. Talking about Catherine Despira, she had gotten so close to the truth of that one. I think yeah. you really want to know. Mm. <laughs> oh my goodness! Wow, I may not want to know the guy. truth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just completely enamored with this vector sector. This is fantastic. So you, you can still steer your shot, either, so. so you can use the right stick still too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's so wow. This is beautiful. Well it's done, Jeremy, if you're watching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. All right. Well, anyway, we've probably been on here long enough, I guess. We've kept you on here, Mike. We really appreciate you joining <laughs> us to just hang out and chat about this stuff because uh, it's awesome. We, so thank you very thank much. You. Well, I'm so happy you guys wanted to do this. Uh, I just love talking about it, and I'm hoping that through this game and like streams like this that you guys do, like we can kind of like convey to people who haven't like really thought about these sorts of things that this is what it really is. It's not just a ROM list. It's not just something I mean, you can go anywhere else for that. Like this is really about capturing the history of basically great moments and great companies and great games and the people behind them over, over like uh, many decades. Now, if you think about 50 years, it's the game industry's lifespan really mm -hmm. uh, as we know it. And so there's so many more stories to tell. And we, uh, this is just the beginning of something that we want to keep pursuing and do this for, you can imagine like for any company, like imagine just doing something like this for Nintendo, not, Necessarily that we would, but if Nintendo did something like right, this, right. that'd be amazing. I like, guess it's just riveting. It's oh, a riveting way to do it. I agree. It would be so great. We're fans of our own work, and I don't mean to sound like conceited, but like we, we just like <laughs> no, this, this style, and I want more people to do it. <laughs> I want more of this. I mean, I feel like Namco <laughs> almost went down this path with Namco Museum on PlayStation, but then they never mm -hmm. really followed it up. And like the PS1 wasn't quite capable to deliver such a seamless experience they did like a modern Namco museum that did everything up through like, say the mid nineties. Oh my goodness. Now, that they were one special. of the chief inspirations for this approach. Like I think anybody who does this sort of stuff, uh, classic game recreations and all this yeah. sort of stuff, probably owe a debt of gratitude to Namco for really oh, yeah. making yep. think differently about it. Mm -hmm. They opened the Absolutely. door. That was a, an amazing thing back then, but, uh, all right. Well, Everyone, thanks for watching for this nice stream, and hopefully we, now that we've kicked the dust off the tires, we'll be back with more streams coming <laughs> up. Uh, I sure hope so. Uh, thanks, as always, for joining me on the stream, Audi. Oh, I loved it, and uh, thank you, Mike. I was so yes, happy to see again you again Mike. and talk to you. No, it was really good fun. All right, Got to find another stream for you to join us. So. Absolutely. I, as many as you invite me to, I'm there. All right, well, All we'll right. keep that in mind.